go on. You've got a PowerPoint presentation. It's got a bunch of pictures. I'm actually going to ask you to turn to page nine on that now because we're going to take things a little out of order. Simply, I, I, I change this every now and then just to make life interesting for me. But, but you've got this PowerPoint presentation. You've also got a packet that talks about dealing with effectively with students who present behavior problems. That's just a little workbook that I put together that talks about how to do a functional assessment and has some tools. We're going to talk about some data collecting tools. Um, you've got a, a, a couple of FBA, or one, one from Alex Fletcher, just a sample FBA that, was, that, that, that I've got in, thrown in there just for you to look at. You've got some material on a young man named Russell Smith. We'll probably get to that this afternoon. Um, in your clip, you have what, what are called blueprints. We brought together about 30-some teachers up in Wisconsin and asked them to identify the 14 most significant behaviors they deal with with kids. And um, asked them to give us examples, talk about what some alternatives. And then we said, OK, let's open it up. And if you open the middle up, it says, OK, if the child is engaged in this behavior, for a t teacher attention. What might be some things as a teacher you would do proactively to teach the child an alternative behavior? What might you do proactively to, to make the current behavior less effective? What could you do reactively to, to, to support the desired behavior, to help eliminate the undesired behavior? And um, then what you might want to avoid. And we have 14 different behaviors. Each one of these sheets is, is a separate behavior. This one happens to be disrespect to teachers. And then on the inside, or on the back cover, you've just got some websites and some, and some resources. So they're just to help you out. They're just to give you some thought. We'll talk about them more this afternoon, but I want you to know that you have them. Uh, you've also got a blank one, in case when you're back at your own school, you want to develop one for another behavior that's not in our packet. You've got the nice little form here. You can make your own. Isn't that cool? Um, and then you have a sheet that's just got a whole bunch of different activities. And we'll talk about this late this afternoon. If I've got kids who have certain functions, what are some things my school may need, want to think about having in place that would allow me to plug this kid in to get some of those functions met? So we'll just use this as a worksheet later on. But those, those are for you. But if you turn to page 9 now on your PowerPoint, we're going to jump over a section, and then we're going to come back and we'll pick it back up. But, but I want to get to some kind of preliminary stuff on behavior first. All right, where are my social workers again? Raise your hands high. It's, be proud to be a social worker. One of my degrees is in social work. Calls them. Okay, now, how many of you have social skills groups? Do you do little social skill groups? Right? Okay, I'm little Ricky. I'm in your social skill group. You're probably teaching me to do different things, right? So all of a sudden, Sarah and Lori are playing. I want to join. How do I come in and ask to join? All those kinds of things, right? Mm -hmm. Now, let's think about this for a minute. Let's say that I'm on the playground, and... Um, Let's see here. We've got your first name? Damien. Damien, again. Yeah, Damien. And um, what's your first name? Jim. Jim. Damien and Jim and I are on the playground. <coughs> Damien has the ball. He's throwing it right between you and I. Jim, we're pretty excited, aren't we? One of us is going to get this ball. All right, I'm excited. Are you excited? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Jim decides that he decides he wants the ball more than he thinks I want the ball, and he shoves me out of the way. How many of you think I'm going to get up and go, oh my gosh, I have a social problem? <laughs> Let me think, how do I solve social problems? What, what, is, what has that social worker been telling? Oh yeah, I could ignore Jim's behavior. Mm, nah, I don't like that. Um, I could use my voice. I don't like it when you push me, Jim, and I wish you would refrain from doing so in the future. Mm, no. Uh, I could ask for help. Excuse me, we're having a bit of a social conundrum. Could you give us a hand? <laughs> right? Or I could just pop him one. How many of you think I'm thinking this through? I'm going through this cognitive process. No, I pop him one. And if I pop him one hard enough, what's going to happen the next time Damien throws the ball? Jim's going to back off. So not only do I have an answer, I've got a damn good answer. It works. I like it. This is good. OK? The only problem is, what's your first name? Mary Beth. Mary Beth doesn't like my answer. So she calls me over. And as a, you know, a good teacher, she would usually say things like, I just saw you hit Jim. And I might say, but Jim, I don't want to hear about what Jim did. Is there anything else you could have done? Now it's a cognitive process. Can our kids generally come up with what they should have done? Yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah I, should, I could have ignored the behavior. I could have asked for help. I could have, you know. And what do we as teachers do then, or as educators? That's right. Aha! 
You knew what you were supposed to do, and you chose not to do it. Therefore, what can I do? Punish them. Right? Now, the problem is, is that's not how the brain works. Okay? Acquisition skills are held in a different way than, than skills that we've got down tight. All right? When we're born, we've got millions of these little neurons. And they look more kind of like this one. They're kind of immature. They don't have many branches. They're thin. As we behave, as we act, the neurons begin to, bridge, or to branch. In fact, that's what learning is. It's the branching of neurons to other neurons. That's learning. And they get thicker, and they fire with far less energy. How many of you learned to drive on a stick shift? Remember when you first sat down, you looked down, you went, shit. <laughs> Who developed this? There are three pedals, I've only got two legs, right? I've got to push down on one, let up with the other one, and it's got to be synchronized, the car is going to die, right? And then I've got to look out the windshield, those side view mirrors, I've got to watch the instrument. This is a pretty damn complicated thing, this called thing called driving. Yeah, that's right. Now, does anybody drive a stick shift today? Do you even think about shifting? No, unless you're on that hill and somebody like me comes right on your bumper and you can't roll back a little bit, you don't have to think about it at all. It's automatic. As humans, we can't possibly think through every action that we engage in or we wouldn't be able to act. So things that we do and do frequently become kind of encoded in terms of, of these neural pathways and it takes very little energy to act on those things. In fact, I'd be willing to bet you that at least some of you have been driving sometime in the last six months, and all of a sudden as you're driving down the road, driving, 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 and you look around, you're going to go, where the hell am I? <laughs> a road you drive on every day, and all of a sudden it's like you just woke up and going, I don't recognize a thing, right? It's because we do all this on automatic pilot. Right? Now what I would like you to do is, like you've got your handout or a piece of paper, your note paper, the, 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 the hotel gave us notepads and pens, I'd like you to take the notepad and the pen. I want you to write your name, first, middle, and last name, in cursive, with your non-preferred hand. Oh, Are you kidding? No, I'm not kidding. Non-preferred hand. Middle name. Whole middle name. You should be done now. Come on, people. Let's go. Crap. It's taking you so long. All right, there are two lessons to be learned by this. The first one we'll talk about now, the second one we'll talk about a little bit later. How many of you had to think about how to form at least one of those letters? Now, did you really not know how to do this? You have the knowledge, don't you? What's the problem? That knowledge is linked up in the other arm, okay? The neural pathway that governs that behavior is in your other arm, okay? When my daughter was 15, we were getting ready to go on vacation and she decided for some ungodly reason, I have no idea why, she decided she would clean her bedroom. We didn't tell her to her anything, right? Now from the time she's been this tall, when I come home at night I take my change out and I put it on my dresser. Somehow that signaled to my daughter it now belongs to her. I don't know how that signaled her but she would come and she steals my change and it's gone into this glass jar and again since she's been about this big. So she was moving this glass jar of coins and the jar shattered and severed her thumb. She lost both tendons and one nerve. So instead of going on vacation, we went to a plastic surgeon so her hand could be repaired. Okay. For the next eight months, everything she would have normally have done with her right hand, she had to do with her left hand. Can kids learn to do that? Yeah, by eight months, she could write pretty well. She could hook all the things 15-year-old girls have to hook, right? All those kind of things that, you know. <laughs> Is it easy? No. no. When we ask kids to change their behavior, it is like asking them to change the hand they write with. It is not going to happen because we've told them twice. It's not going to happen because they're 15 and should know better. It is only going to happen when we give them the new behavior, allow them to practice that new behavior as the response to the situation frequently enough that the neural pathway develops to be able to compete with the neural pathway of the behavior we want them to give up. OK? 
Okay, we've got to remember that when we're changing behavior. This is not a quick and easy thing. It's a process, and it's a process that takes time and feedback. So again, part of the issue of doing a functional assessment and developing a behavior intervention plan is making sure teachers recognize the challenge they're taking on when they go about trying to change behavior. Okay? If knowledge were all it took to change behavior, people, I would be thin. Okay? Well, knowledge is necessary, it clearly is not sufficient. Okay? There has to be something more. So you've got to keep that in mind when we're working with kids and their behavior. We also have to keep in mind how schools work. Again, that's that unique place. All right, we'll play with this one for a little bit. I like this is the part I like best of this whole end service. What's four plus four? People. This is the <laughs> easiest question you're going to get all day. I absolutely guarantee it. Some of you have already learned it doesn't doesn't is not worthwhile risking here. Okay, four plus four is eight. eight. How did you learn this? Practice. You practiced it. Anybody learn a different way? You all just practiced it. Counting on your fingers. Yeah. Somebody gave you manipulatives, right? God. Okay. And you went one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And then some teacher or your parent or somebody gave you this kind of strategy called grouping, right? And you went one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You now have the associative property, uh, property go forth and add, right? What do teachers do then? Subtract. Okay, probably before they went into subtraction, they, now they probably gave you practice. You've probably done this four plus four what? 12, 13 times in your life? Thousands. Yeah, hundreds of thousands of times, right? Do you ever go to the store, pick up items, add them in your head, and come up to the counter, put them down, and find out that you misadded? Yep. Yeah, so even though you've done it thousands of times, do we still make mistakes? Important to remember with kids when they're doing behavior change, there are going to be backsliding, there's going to be mistakes. Okay? Now, Let's say that I grew up in a school district. We'll pretend it's Chicago Public Schools, once called the worst school district in our country, right? By a former Secretary of Education. Wasn't that helpful? All right. And I learned that four plus four was nine. <laughs> my teacher gave me gold stars. My mom hung on the refrigerator. And I moved to Lincoln Way District. And all of a sudden, now I put it, and you say, what's four plus four? I go, I know, it's nine. What's going to happen to me? They're going to laugh at you. Yeah, somebody's going to laugh at me, and the teacher's probably going to say what? Wrong. But I know it's nine. I've already got that neural pathway worked out. Easier or harder for me to learn that it's eight now? Harder. 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 Little harder? No. Six to ten times more practice to unlearn the, eight, the nine and learn the eight. Okay. Now, let's think about how we do some of this teaching. Let's say that I was out late last night. Maybe I went to, you know, this weekend, you know, they had all the parades for. St. Patty's Day, and I kind of took part in some of those, had a little fun in Chicago, and maybe visited a couple of pubs and tried out some green beer, even though this next weekend I'm going to even do more of this, right? And uh, I'm not feeling real good today. So all of a sudden, you know, Kim puts down nine. Might I just go, oh, hell, that's close enough. <laughs> I'm taking anything between six and 11 today. <laughs> Would a teacher do this? Wouldn't be very effective. In fact, even things that aren't as cut and dry in math, for academics, we generally have a rubric for what we're looking at as a correct answer. How about with behavior? Do I ever do something like that with behavior? Didn't even see Melissa do it, because I don't want to deal with that today. I've had to watch where a teacher will smile the first time a kid does something and scold them the next time they do the very same behavior. Okay. Would I ever do something like, nine is wrong. I'm going to let you go this time. But if you put down nine again, I'm going to have to mark it wrong. Do we give warnings for academic errors? No. Do we give warnings for behavior? Last warning for talk out, young man. Last warning. You get out to your seat one more time, Sarah. Okay. Do we ever do things? We'll pick on you now. I'd like you to stand up. <laughs> Teacher for not sitting there. <laughs> nine? Four plus four is nine? Could you explain to the rest of us that know how to add how you managed to get nine? <laughs> it's no wonder you're flunking this class. Sit down. Is this funny to you? Wipe that smile off your face. 
Do we ever jump in kids' faces when they make an academic error? Sometimes. Actually, sometimes we do. Are we more likely to do this for, for a behavioral issue? Yeah, because behavior triggers emotion in us. Okay, would I ever do something like Damien? Nine is wrong. The first time you put down nine, young man, I'm gonna mark it wrong once. If you persist in this behavior and put down nine again, I'm gonna mark it wrong twice, Damien. <laughs> The third time you put down nine, Damien, I'm gonna mark it wrong three times. And the fourth time, young man, you are out of my classroom. Do we use accelerated consequences for academic errors? Oh. Academic. We must not care about academics. Why don't we use these terribly effective strategies for academics? Because it's not personal. Okay. When kids act up, I think in classrooms, teachers take it. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Part of it is that, is that emotional issue that, that triggers. Okay. Okay. But why don't we use why don't we use these effective strategies? They're effective for behavior. Why aren't we using these for, for academics? Because they're stupid. Most of these we know. If you put them to academics, you go. That would be a dumb way to teach that. It'd be like my saying, "That is not how we decode, young lady. You are done with reading class. You will get this back when you can read." <laughs> They, they want to teach. So when somebody makes an academic error, oh, this is where I'm. Mm -hmm. But when they, they should already have their behaviors before they walk into my classroom. What do you mean? They should, well, I'm just. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. No, you know, they should be able to sit down. I shouldn't have to deal with behavior. Exactly. Okay, all right. I and, shouldn't and, have to deal with the academics because that's why I'm a teacher. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't have to deal with your behavior. Okay. Anybody ever told that when you were a teacher that you, the behavior won't be part of your job? <laughs> okay. okay. I think that's one of those issues. I think, that, I think we really do have to do a better job of helping teachers, A, realize that there's not an academic child and a behavioral child. There's just a child. And they bring both in. Right? And in fact, much of the behavior you're going to deal with is actually pretty effective behavior for this kid. All right, it's, it's problem solving. All right. The other thing I think that's really important to realize is that it is the very same knowledge that I bring to bear on your math that I need to bring to bear on your learning, on your behavior. I need to teach kids how to behave, just like I need to teach kids how to add. It is the very same skills. But the problem is, is we think it's different. And most teachers go, well, I was never taught how to deal with behavior. Well, if you were taught how to deal with academics, you were taught how to deal with behavior. <coughs> It's the very same process. We just don't think of it that way. And I think, again, that's part of, if we're going to embrace this positive behavioral supports, a non-punitive approach to dealing with behavior, we're going to have to make sure that we help teachers realize you've got the tools, and let's kind of liberate these tools so teachers can bring them to bear with the kid's behavior. Because it, it's there. It's the very same thing. We'll talk more about that as we go through. But what I've got to do is realize that it's the same skills. I've got to teach kids. Okay. Now we're, I think, let me go to the next one. Yeah, now we're, well, we'll, go, we'll talk about these couple things and we'll, then we'll go back. If I'm teaching you that 4 plus 4 equals 8, do I have to teach you what the expected answer is in the process of teaching you? Do I also teach you what are non-answers? I mean, so if you put down 9, do I say, no, that's wrong? Yeah. I have to have clear expectations about what I'm looking for as a correct answer. The same is true with behavior. I can't just tell you, no, Damien, that's not what you're supposed to do. That would be like me trying to teach you that 4 plus 4 was 8 by saying, you just guess the number and I'll tell you when you're right. Nope, not 16. Nope, not 42. Nope, not 33. I've got to teach you what I want you to answer, and I've got to teach you what is wrong answers. The same thing is true with behavior. I've got to teach a child what is the appropriate behavior as well as what's the inappropriate behavior. I've got to be clear about those expectations. I've got to know what I'm looking for. I always get this teacher who kind of goes, you know, Yasmin, 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 you know, and she goes, what? You know what, young lady? I always want the kid to come and say, well, you know, I'm really not sure, because the first time I did this, you kind of smiled. Now you've kind of got your underwear in a bundle. I don't know what the problem is here. You know, why, why, are, you, why are you upset, right? What's the problem? Okay? Kids oftentimes don't know what it is that we're looking at and why we're looking at it. So I may have to teach them. They should do what they shouldn't do. We ever have problems with respect for authority? No, never. Never. 
Where do kids learn this? Respect for authority. <laughs> parents. Have all of our kids learned from their parents? Not necessarily. So where are they going to learn it? <laughs> Television. Bart Simpson will teach them about respect, right? In fact, most of the sitcoms our kids watch, part of the humor is the kids misbehaving as far as respect for adults. But for some of our kids, that's, not, that's, that's the way life is. They really do talk to their parents this way. Now, think about your school, honestly. The kids who are most disrespectful, are they also the ones who are likely to be taught to most disrespectfully by staff? Do kids learn more by what they are told or what they see? By what they experience, what they see. Um, you know, University of Illinois Chicago was, was kind of, I don't know how this happened, but like we've got kind of a partnership now with one of the Chicago public schools. And so the dean called me in last year and said, you know, Rick, you're going to work with the school and you're going to help them with discipline. And I was kind of like, thank you, I think, okay. And so I thought, well, I better see what this school is like. So I went the next day, and as I'm walking into the school, I'm walking out of the, the second period, I'm walking out of the learning center. There's a group of students and a teacher getting ready to come into the learning center, and a group of students and a teacher getting ready to go back to their classroom from the learning center. So there's two adults out there, and there's another adult that has a kid against the wall going, say it again. Say it again. You better not say it again. <laughs> and I'm standing there going, shh. Now, if I don't say anything, if none of the three adults say anything to this, to this other adult, what are we telling 60-some kids? It's okay to do that. Perfectly okay for adults to talk to children this way. Yet, do we have a way in our schools to talk to each other when we see this kind of thing happening? No. Do we know what happens? Absolutely. So that first evening, one of the first things we did is we started talking about respect. Usually what I do is some kind of a fun, like, fun activity. I give, the kid, I give the student, or the teachers, I have the teacher meeting, you're, all, you're the teachers of my one school. I hand out like a blue three by five card. I say, I want you to write down all the behaviors you see kids do that get in the way of their learning here. And I collect the blue cards, and I give you a yellow card. So now I want you to talk about, write down all the things you see teachers do, or that you know you do that gets in the way of learning here. And then I put both lists up. What do you think you find when you do that? There, you could switch the lists. It's, it's really amazing. I've done this in hundreds of schools, and they're almost the exact same list. Now, th to me, that's kind of interesting, and it gives us a very, very powerful way to start dealing with things, because if we could model better ways that we handle those issues, do you think we could help the kids learn how to model, do better ways themselves? Yeah, so the first thing we started talking about, let's talk about respect. We identified all the things that dealt with respect. Can we, as a faculty, agree? If you see me screaming at a kid, I'm probably not wanting to do that. He jumped on that last nerve, I lost it, but it's not the me I want to be. So if you see me doing that, I'm going to give you permission, Damien, to somehow intervene. Okay? Now how are we going to do that? Well, we developed a code. If I walk up and all of a sudden you're engaged in a behavior that's inappropriate, or at least from my perspective, I might say, is everything okay? Need any help? That's not means, is everything okay? Do you need any help? That means, you've lost it, honey, back off, I'm taking over. Okay? <laughs> Because that's going to happen. And so it became a process of, as we begin to look at the setting, saying, what do we know we're doing? Let's make our schools a little less pathological. Let's recognize some of those things and find ways to support ourselves as teachers. Allows me to save face, allows me to protect the child. That's the key issue, as we know what's going to happen. As opposed to this everybody kind of going, we just don't talk about it. Or at best, we'll say, we know we really shouldn't be doing these things. All right, everybody got that? Good. All right, go out and do your thing. Okay? No, and full well, it's going to happen. You can't have a, that many kids and not have somebody lose it. So let's admit it. Let's deal with it. Part of the issue now, let's think about when do kids become disrespectful? What kind of things trigger disrespect on a child? When they're frustrated. All right, I'm, I can't do this. You're up there going, do it, do it, do it. I can't do it. Right? So I'm just going to go, ah, this is bullshit. You and the horse you rode in on. Right? What else might trigger my becoming disrespectful? I'm being treated unfairly. You're, asking, you're, you're, you're doing something, you know, you didn't do anything to her, but all of a sudden, boy, you're on me for talking out. What's the story here? You're on me for getting out of my seat, and yet she's been clawing around, striping her pencil for three days. All right? Threatened or they feel confronted. Okay, you, you're correcting me in front of all of my peers. 
All right, I don't know what I'm supposed to do here. You're telling me I've got to do it. I don't know what it is I'm supposed to do. I think I did it. Let's say I'm that ADHD kid. You just gave me nine steps. I did the last one. I think I'm done, right? Because <laughs> that's all I can remember, okay? Now you're on me. I'm going, what? I was fine, right? The heck's your problem, okay? Somebody else had their hand up back here. All right, you're just giving me a, yeah, all of a sudden you're, you're, you're doing something that's making, making it very difficult for me to, you know, Especially if I've got to save face in front of my peers. Yeah. All right? Now, can you think of anything in your school, your school setting, that a kid could say? I think one of the problems that we, what we want them to do is to sit down and shut up in those situations, right? I think those days of passive responses are gone. I think kids are looking for active responses. Can you think of anything actively the kid could do that all the teachers in your school would see as being a proactive response to the problem? Excuse me. Mrs. France, right? I know that you think I did something wrong, but I really don't see it, and you're correcting me in front of all of my peers. Could we talk about this later, just you and I? <laughs> that all of your teachers would go, well, that was an appropriate way to deal with this. Yeah, but nobody's going to say that. Okay. Well, would they even accept it? Have you even spent five minutes in any faculty meeting you've ever been in to even discuss what they could say actively? What we want to do is sit down and shut up. That's pretty unrealistic in most cases, I think, for some of the kids we're talking about. So part of what we've got to do is, to another aspect of this behavior issue, is we've got to start challenging ourselves to live in this world, to live in this day, and to, and, to, and to teach kids what they should do. Those are those alternative behaviors, in many cases, that we should be helping them develop. All right, so we're met here. All right, how will this be taught? It's going to be taught directly. Just like you teach math. I'm going to teach children what the expected behavior is. I'm going to give you practice. I'm going to give you feedback on it. I may set problems up just so you can face them. So we can see that you have the skill. Just like I do when I do math. How many of you were sitting around last summer going, you know what I need is one more curriculum? I got this open spot on Thursdays if I could just find something to teach. Okay? We are over inundated in terms of what we're supposed to be teaching. So what we've got to learn to start doing is double dipping. Can I teach, let's say I'm a, I'm, I'm a language arts class, I'm supposed to teach story, plot, character, setting. Can I do that with a book that deals with bullying as the theme? What I've got to start doing is realizing what are the problems I'm trying to work with and find ways to double dip in terms of material. Now, in most major libraries, there's a book called a Bibliotherapy Index. If I go in a Bibliotherapy Index, it will have things like bullying, and it will give me the names of books that have that as the theme at various reading levels. So what I may have to do is, while I'm teaching the one topic, I'm going to also have it so that we can discuss issues like bullying. What did character A see the problem as? What did character B? What did the kids do that were watching? All those kinds of things. Because now, as I'm testing comprehension, we're also teaching strategies and, and beginning to be able to introduce information. I've got to learn to double dip. All right, now we're going to go back to where we should have been. Sorry about that, folks, but I just like to have that first part. OK. So let's say that I've got my wonderful school. We've got a good academic program going on. We understand about behavior. Am I going to have behavior problems still? Yes. Absolutely. OK. I'm still going to have kids who have behavior problems. Now, again, let's think a little bit about school. Let's say I happen to have a young man here. His name is Brian. Brian's a third grade student. He has a mild learning disability. We know a couple more things about Brian. He lives at home with his mom, three brothers. His dad passed away. Mom works a minimum wage job. OK, we know one more thing. Brian loves pens and pencils. You guys all have very boring pens and pencils here. <laughs> all right, hold yours up. All right. So Gloria here has a nice pen. If Brian walks in, he, yeah, it's one of those that pushes, all right. Brian happens to walk in before Gloria gets to her desk. That might just end up in Brian's pencil box. We're not sure how, but it might end up there. All right, he loves these pens and pencils. We know one more thing. When the bell rings for lunch, he beats it out of that classroom and runs down the hall, and if you happen to get in his way, he's going to knock you over. He's already knocked over a few kids. 
You are my teachers. You are out in my hallway, and you see Brian come zipping past you. What do you do? Stop. All right, Brian, stop, right? Verbal rep if we were playing family feud right now, verbal reprimand is the number one thing teachers do when a kid engages in inappropriate behavior. So bing, verbal reprimand, okay? What else might you be doing? What else might you do? Make him stop and walk. All right, obviously you've forgotten how to walk, Brian. You need to stop. We're gonna walk back to the classroom, and then we're gonna <laughs> walk down to the lunchroom, and just to make sure, maybe we'll walk back to the classroom, and then back down to the lunchroom. All right, what else might you do? Hold him until everybody else. All right, you're gonna stay right here with me, all right? You just want an all expense paid trip to the end of the line. <laughs> Right? What else could I do? Huh? Why were you running? Uh -huh. right. I love that. Why? Uh -huh. Okay. What else could we do? Give him attention. Make him hold my hand. You'll hold, we'll walk to lunch together. Right? Now, what do all of those things generally share in common? They're based on punishment. Do I really think he forgot how to walk? No, I'm thinking if I slow him down enough, he'll think twice before he runs tomorrow. Am I having him hold my hand because I'm psychodynamically trained and I believe he has to rely on my ego strength in order to get down there? No, all right. Why am I having to punish him? Now, he's got a learning disability. All right, let's just say this is interfering with his learning. I'm not sure it does, but let's say that it could qualify as we have to do a functional assessment. Why might Brian be running? I'm hungry. And if I get down there first, there are bigger pieces of meat, bigger desserts, and smaller servings of vegetables. Right? <laughs> okay. Why else might I be running? To get his place at the table. Yeah, there's a good table. It's the first one that goes out to recess. I want to be at that table right next to the door. So my keister is the first one out the door. I want to be there. All right? That's the popular kid table. That's where little Sally sits. And by golly, I'm in love with that young lady. Okay? Maybe. I got to be down at that table. Maybe it's for isolation. He wants okay. to be I want to be. I don't want to be by everybody else. There's big kids that want to pick on me. Right? Kevin's told me that in the hallway his butt's, you know, my butt's his. So I gotta get from the teacher to the lunchroom monitor with no waste of time. Right? He's gonna bully me. Why else might I be running? What's that? Yeah, maybe I'm that ADHD kid. I've been sitting all day and I was like, ah, I gotta run. Right? I'm LD. I'm not the brightest kid in the classroom, but you know what? I run like a deer. <laughs> Nobody can touch me. This is what I'm good at. All right? Yeah. You know where Sandwich, Illinois is? Anybody know where Sandwich, Illinois is? Years ago, I was a doc student at the time, I was called to Sandwich, Illinois. They had started an in-school suspension program. And all of a sudden, everybody was going to in-school suspension. And they called and said, Rick, you've got to come out and help us. Give us a chance. See what's going on here. What they had done is they would hired the sweetest little old lady you could ever possibly ask for to run their in-school suspension. And she was going, honey, what did you do to get sent down here? She was bringing cookies. Now, you can just see the kids kind of going, math, cookies. Let me think about this. All right, this is a tough decision, OK? So you know, it's a, you know, but maybe there's this nice little old lady. And if I get down there, it's the one place in school I get unconditional support. Maybe okay. running to get away from stealing the pen. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't want to get caught. Now, does it matter as to which one of these reasons I'm running as to what you might do as an intervention? Yeah. If I'm running because I'm hungry, what might be a good intervention? Snack, or maybe you would actually set me up to get down there first as you realize this kid's got a legitimate need. He's got to get some food in him. What if I'm running because Kevin wants to beat me up? Now we've got to do some kind of an issue around bullying here in terms of the victim, the, the, the person, plus probably the entire classroom. Right? But I've got to figure out what's going on as to what would be the best solution for this. Now, <coughs> Gary Larson gives us a hand. Many systems talk about the fact that. If I look at behavior interventions, kids engage in behavior for one of two reasons, either to escape or to gain. To escape or avoid or gain. Now for me, I find it to be more helpful if I can identify, are they escaping to or escaping from? And if they're trying to gain something, what exactly are they trying to gain? Because if I'm going to give them some kind of an alternative, it's got to meet that same issue. <coughs> okay. Now, well, before I get in here, let's go back up here. What, what were some of the interventions? What might we have typically done with Brian? I'm sorry, I, I forgot this. What would we might do to change Brian's behavior? We've got to do it positively, right? We can't just use punishment. Okay, how would we, in the, you know, thinking about what teachers typically do, what would I probably do? What might I probably have done? <coughs> Remind them of class before they leave. 
Okay, I might, use, might remind the class, all right? But I want to do something for Brian. Brian's running, I want him to stop running. This is what I know about Brian. For years, and in middle school still, part of what we think about is when a kid is not, so Kim is not doing what I want her to do, I start thinking, what does Kim like? Oh, Kim likes pencils. Kim, if you don't run, I've got a pencil for you. Might that work? Maybe. Yeah, for a little while, maybe. Why wouldn't it continue to work, perhaps? Too many. Okay, once I've got all the pencils I need, all right, I get satiation, okay. How many of you think Kim is running for a pencil? It has nothing to do with why the kid is doing it. I mean, I'll, I'll go to schools, it's kind of like when you do your math and you can go to the computer. Well, she's not not doing the math because she wants to be on the computer. It might be enough to pull her through for a while, but it's probably not going to be the end all be all because it doesn't deal with that function. The other thing we do is that if that doesn't work, I start thinking, what do you like? And I say, and if you don't do your math, you won't see the computer until you're 60. Right? We take everything they like away you know, as a way to punish them. And, and again, part of the new thinking this whole functional thing is that it's not just finding something they like, it's finding something that's functionally equivalent because the functions are usually legitimate and they have a need to get that function met. Can I give them an appropriate way to do it? If I don't, they're going to take the inappropriate way. So again, Gary Larson gives us a hand here with some of these situations. Don't encourage him, Sylvia. What's going on here? What's happening in this picture? Showing off. What's he want? What's the, what's the function? Attention. attention. Okay. Do we ever have kids who do things for attention? Okay. Now, whenever you have a child doing something and you think attention is the function, always ask where does the attention lead? Because especially for small children, unless I get an adult's attention, I can't get anything. So while I need attention, that really may not be the thing that supports the behavior. It's what the attention leads to. Okay. So always say, for example, the peacock here, is he only looking for attention? <coughs> Is that why peacocks do this? They just want the females to attend to them? To notice them? Yeah, they want to spend at least some, some little bit of undivided time with at least one of those young hens, right? So I always ask, where does the attention lead? No way I'm going to that party tonight. I won't know anyone there, and that means I'll be introduced. And you know I never learned to shake. <coughs> What's going on here? Hmm? Okay, so what's he trying to do? Avoid. He's trying to avoid a situation where he's got to do something he can't do. Do we ever have kids who do that? All the time. Is that a legitimate need? Absolutely. Is attention a legitimate need? Absolutely. No way. I'll put my magazine down when you put your magazine down. <laughs> what's going on here? Power. power and control. Do we ever have kids who need power and control? Any of you have any oppositional defiant kids? Okay, oftentimes power and control can be a really powerful issue in terms of that I've got to have some, some sense of, of control over my life. We've got kids who go home and have no control. We've also got kids who go home and have all the control. Then they come to school and have to ask our permission to pee. If you deal with every, I don't know what's, what's, where your schools or what you're doing, if you ever deal with gang kids, I do a lot of work with gang kids. One of the big problems with gang kids is oftentimes they go out, the street gives them a certain level of autonomy. The gang gives them a sense of who I am, what's going on. They come to school and we expect them to, to surrender all of that autonomy. It isn't going to happen. One of the things we, have to, we know we have to build into a situation for kids with gang, gang affiliation is a way for them to maintain that sense of control and autonomy if we're going to maintain them in the school. All right, Rushy's at the club. What's going on here? All right, peer fit, you want to be peer affiliation. Remember the kid when we were in school used to burp out words? Remember that kid? <laughs> I literally went home trying to figure out if I could learn how to do that because I really thought that was kind of cool. And I thought if I could get that down, boy, I could be neat. All right, I never quite got it, okay? Now let's say I'm burping out words. Am I going to stop it just because Melissa, as my teacher, doesn't like it? No, why? As long as you guys are all laughing at me and that's the only time I've got you with me, trust me, I'm going to keep burping out words. When am I going to stop? When you guys don't laugh, and when Melissa gives me a better way to get you with me, because if she doesn't, I'll just come up with something else. Well, what if I step on the top, on top of the table and do a two-step? Did I get you to laugh? All right. Part of it is you've got to give me some other equivalent to get that need that I have to be, to be affiliated. Is, is peer affiliation a legitimate need? <coughs> Absolutely. 
Just stay in the cat burn. Maybe that bear's hurt. Maybe he ain't. And you see it's Bob's honeys, berries, and grubs. Okay. Sometimes just a actual tangible situation. Kathy's got the ball. I want the ball. Bap. I got the ball. Life is good. Okay. For crying out loud, Warren can't just beat your chest like everyone else. And Warren's got this fart thing going on under his arm. <laughs> How many of you teach middle school? Sometimes it's not necessarily attention, but sometimes kids will try on new identities just to see, is this, is this okay? Do I like this one? You know? And so it's just kind of their, their sense of who I am, kind of their independence, whatever. It's this issue of just trying something new on. You guys both are witnesses. He laughed when my marshmallow caught fire. And you see his six gun is smoking and there's a guy laying on the ground with his stick sticking up there. What's going on there? Revenge, okay. Now again, people question whether or not these are legitimate functions. Um, but part of what, at least from my experience, is that you know, it's, it's what, what am I gaining? And sometimes <laughs> these are things that I find seem to be what kids are looking for. And if I build my plans to actually feed those issues, I'm going to be way ahead than if I just say it's just to gain and don't talk about what is it trying to gain. So trying to, be, to, to add clarification, for me, has, has, has at least resulted in, I think, better plans. Okay. So again, the process becomes one of this issue, what issue I've got to figure out what's behavior. Now again, how many of you have kids who have only one behavior? So how do you decide which behavior you're going to target? The one that That's interrupts one. the most. The one that interrupts the one. The one that, that creates the most problem for the child, limits their independence the most, okay? That may be one thing a lot of people go from, like, from dangerous, okay, to disruptive, to maladaptive kind of a situation. One of the other things you've got to keep in mind is who you're working with as a team. The less skilled the team is, I may pick a behavior that they're more likely to be successful with. It may not be the one the kid needs to change the most, but until I get this team willing to work with me, as a team, these, these processes actually work, I may pick one that I can actually make an impact on relatively quickly, because then I can build confidence. For example, oftentimes, like, like school-wide, how many of you are familiar with positive behavioral interventions and supports, PBIS, the kind of school-tiered thing? Um, big, big movement here in Illinois, it's, a, it's a, around the country, but, it's, but Illinois, because of, of Lucille Eber, is, is, is really a, a main player. Um, part of the issue there is trying to develop school-wide clarity around what are, the, what are the rules, what are the expectations of behavior, good quality instruction, some of the things we've already talked about as a school-wide issue. Then a second tier of supports for kids who the, the school-wide isn't enough. And then the third tier is for kids who need individualized plans. So those will be the kids we'd be doing the FBAs and, and the BIPs on. We'll, talk, we'll see this model a little bit later. Um, one of the things that looking at, at that model, oftentimes, at least for, for me, especially middle schools and high schools, one of the first behaviors I'll oftentimes try to help the school identify will be something they can change pretty quickly. One that comes up frequently is, is tardy. Now, one of the big issues in TARDI is that in your classroom, I have to be in my seat, sitting down, ready to learn when the bell rings. In your class, I just have to be in the classroom. And as far as Kathy's concerned, if I get there any time before the class is over, life is good, because she doesn't believe in all these TARDI slips. So I've got three different definitions of TARDI. Is that a problem for some of our kids? Yeah. Absolutely, because all of a sudden, I'm in your classroom. You give me a TARDI slip because I'm not in my chair. I think this is your problem. You're just a bitch. <laughs> right? That's the problem. Okay? Nobody else is like that. Okay. Part of the issue is that if I've got 25 different definitions of tardy, and I've got kids who are still trying to figure out how to deal with this, this is going to be a problem. So we'll oftentimes go in and say, well, first of all, we can't afford to spend the time. I was in Kankakee at one of the high schools in Kankakee. They were spending one half of a staff member just dealing with tardies. Between writing the slips, filing the slips, entering the stuff in the computer, they burnt away a half a staff member. And we said, you know what? We can't afford that kind of time. We can't afford 27 different definitions of tardy. We're, it's, it's, too, it's, it's taking too much time. We're losing too much instructional time. Tardy for this school is when the bell rings. You close your door. If a child's body is not inside that classroom, he is tardy, period. You cannot have a more tight definition. That's the definition. And what we're going to do is, as a school, that's what we're going to start. And what we're going to do the first few weeks, when the door gets closed, if this happens to be your two planning periods, what we'd like you to do is surrender about 15 minutes of that planning period, walk with the administration, we'll get all the kids who are in the hallway, taking to room 104, issue whatever the consequence is. What do you think will happen after about a week and two weeks of doing that? 
the tardy number drops tremendously because once we've got this clear expectation, clear it, kids who are just playing the system stop playing it. Who do I have left out there in the hallway when the door is closed? Kids who are really tardy. Yeah, the ADHD kid is going, but I can't make it from here to my locker and back here. It's like, you're right, you can't. Maybe we need to do something about this. All of a sudden I start to identify the kids who need some help. And that may become a second tier. All right, so, so part of the issue is that being clear about what's going on. So I go again in terms of this whole function thing. If I've got a child, what's the target behavior? What, am I clear? Am I clear about what that behavior is? And when we get done, we're going to break for lunch. When we get done with lunch, what we're going to do is come back. We're going to practice some stuff on, on writing operational definitions. We're going to look at how we collect data, how we make decisions on data, and then how that translates into a behavioral intervention plan. So we're going to go back through these steps all right, in more, in more detail. All right, let's break for lunch. Uh, 45 minutes and then we're back here. So I have 12.01. I'm sure that you had a very vigorous discussion of all these things over lunch, and you, that's what all you talked about, right? All right, let's go ahead and start up again then. Um, as we'd mentioned earlier, there are, there's no set forms or issues around a functional assessment in most cases, but there are a number of strategies or steps that you move through. Again, the issue is identification of a target behavior. From that, you generally have some sort of a hypothesis as to why we think the child might be doing this. You then collect data. Sometimes the data has already been collected. It's a matter of just exploring the data to see does that confirm or does it allow you to, or does it lead you to reject that, that initial hypothesis and, and create a new one. You ultimately do some sort of form of verification. You then have what you consider to be the function. You then develop a plan. And in most cases, if you've got a child who's engaging in an inappropriate behavior, your plan will actually be two plans in most cases. One plan to make that current inappropriate behavior less effective, and another plan to make a new behavior, a desirable behavior that serves the same function, effective. So oftentimes that's where your positive behavioral supports come into play, is in the building up of the new behavior. Um, you're then going to implement that behavior, monitor it, make sure it's working, and oftentimes they're going to need to be tweaked. Uh, as you're working through things, it needs to be changed or adapted or, or, or altered in some way to fit the, the situation at hand. All right, as we mentioned before, these behavior problems come into play in a number of issues, and I know that, again, there, some forms have fewer, you know, that we're all we're looking at as a gain or, 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 or escape, and others have more. Part of it, again, for me is that if I can get information that gives me the more, a more definitive idea of what the kid is actually looking for, the more targeted my intervention can be. But use it if it helps. If it doesn't help, then you know, go with whatever works. But knowledge deficits. Sometimes I, does a child know what's expected? Maybe they know, for example, I worked with a young lady one time who was cognitively impaired, and the minute that she would see you, she would say, hi. Now, if you walked out of her vision and came back in her vision, she'd say, hi. She knew what to do. She just didn't have all the skills of knowing when do you do it, right? Now, the problem with that is that if you, when somebody would come into her vision, she'd say, hi, most of us are kind of going, damn, what do we do, right? Because she's being nice, so you say hi. Well, then you're reinforcing this inappropriate, her saying hi, which just incre And so it became this vicious cycle. And people would literally walk way out of the way to not pass Loretta so that we wouldn't have to be in that bind in terms of what was going on. Um, to communicate intent, language impaired kids, oftentimes I can't tell you I've done enough of this. I don't understand what you're asking me, whatever's going on, and I'll engage in inappropriate behavior as a way of being able to indicate to you that I don't either, I'm confused, I don't understand whatever this is, is happening. Sensory perceptual needs. We're going to have some kids, again, who stereotypic behavior, for example, is, is, a, is a very common uh, response, uh, oftentimes for kids who, who uh, have cognitive impairments, sometimes kids who have, who have vision impairments. Um, and sometimes these can, can lead to a number of, of, of issues. They may not have started off being in a situation. For example, kids who are blind oftentimes will push on their eye. If you push on your eye, what do you see? Stars, Stars and sparkle and color. That's, you know, if that's all that you've got for input, that, that's pretty cool. Well, the more you do it, the more you have to do it. And literally, they will push their eyes back into their brain. Um, so you may have to really engage in some kind of a serious issue in terms of dealing with these behaviors. 
Um, but it's, it's the, you know, the, the payoffs in, inside. Um, attention, escape, tangible reward, affiliation, revenge, a number of those things that we talked about before. Now oftentimes I have to, again, when I'm thinking about a target behavior, kids don't have just one, but as I'm looking at my target behavior, I usually want to ask myself a series of questions. Does this child have an inappropriate or an antisocial behavior displayed in place of the of desired behavior? Yes or no? All right, if they do, then they're in this column. You know, no, there's no inappropriate behavior. They just don't show the desired behavior. So in other words, she's not doing anything bad. She's just not doing the work. So all I really have to do is just get her engaged in work. Lori, on the other hand, is telling me what to do with the work. And there's all kinds of problem behaviors on top of the fact that she's not doing the work. So now I've got to deal with that inappropriate behavior plus the fact that she's not doing the work. Does the student have the knowledge or skill to display it? So it's a knowledge. It's, it's a, they have the knowledge. It's a motivational issue. Or they don't have the knowledge. If they don't have the knowledge, what's part of the intervention going to have to be? Give them the knowledge. I've got to somehow provide them the knowledge, and I probably have to adjust the demands initially to meet the knowledge they have. So I didn't target behavior. What you've got to decide again is which behavior you want to work on. Oftentimes it's the, it's the most serious one, the one that's limiting the child's freedoms or, or independence. But again, it might be the one I can have the best impact on the quickest. So you're going to decide based on the skill level of your team, based on the needs of the child, what, you, what you're going to be able to put in, in place in terms of the behavior. You're going to develop an operational definition. Now an operational definition makes this behavior observable and measurable. Okay, observable and measurable. So what you're writing is a description. You're going to describe this behavior in such a way that somebody who does not know the child could read your description and say, yes, he's doing it right now, or no, he's not. What are some of the target behaviors you guys have written operational definitions for in the past? What are ones that you work with pretty frequently? Talking out of time. Talking out. Okay. What else? Leaving the room. Okay. What I'd like you to do is get together in a team. Write an operational definition for talking out or leaving the room. All right. What you think is a good operational definition. I want one person of the team to be willing to, to, to present it to the, to, the, to the group. And we're going to talk about operational definition. We're going to use a couple of examples. All right. So you can get together in really, you know, small groups and, and figure this out. One more minute. Operational definition. Yes. What which behavior did you do? Talking out. Talking out. Okay. What's a talk out? Any vocalization that occurs without the teacher acknowledging or calling on the student. All right. Any vocalization without the teacher acknowledging or calling on the student. What do people think? <laughs> Any vocalization without the teacher acknowledging or calling on the student. Right. Do we need to put that in context because if it's a group or do you want them to talk? Well, that's what I was thinking. Or do you want to say during instructional? All right, so one issue is, is that that would be any time. So if we were in a group situation, they were talking, they talked, that would be a target behavior, right? Okay. So part of the issue, that, that's one of those issues oftentimes that has to be in place, is that what are the realities around, and we'll, we'll even look at that a little bit more carefully as you're looking at antecedents to behavior. All right, so. Obviously, we have to think about you know what's what's going on. Any before we move to that one, any other problems with that one? All right, gestures or signs would be okay. So if I gave you the flip flip picture of the bird, that wouldn't be a, that would be a, that wouldn't be a talk out. All right, is it a talk out? Some people are going no. Some people are going yes. See, this is the issue. That's you know if people are worried about vocalizations, that's not a talk out. So that would that might be okay. It might not be. But you want you, what, what you want to do when you're doing this is you want somebody to play devil's advocate with you. Are we also counting this? Are we also counting this? But you also want to be clear. I don't want to have every behavior, because then it becomes one of those things that piss me off definitions. 
If I'm talking about talkouts, I'm talking about talkouts. If I'm talking about gestures, maybe I'm talking about gestures. All right, you've got to decide where you're going to draw the line. Any other problems with it, with, or, 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 or strengths with that particular talk, with that particular definition of talkout? Um, some of it may be appropriate, like if she asks what page are we on or something. I wouldn't consider that a talkout. Okay, so it might be appropriate. So we don't know what to do with that, right? All right, that could be a problem. What's acknowledge mean? What do you mean by a teacher acknowledges it? Like looking at them, maybe. Looking at them. So if I look at them, it's acknowledgement. Calling on their name. Any other problem? Any other way? We don't know what acknowledge means, do we? So could that be a problem when we go in and say, well, I think they acknowledged it. And somebody else says, well, I didn't say that it was acknowledged. All right. You've got any, any, once you've developed your, your operational definition, look at each word and say, how loaded is this word to interpretation? If there's lots of room for interpretation, you might want to clarify that word. In some cases, you may have to give examples, all right? Or you might try to pick a different word that's not quite so maybe vague, all right? Um, all right, so it, let's say that we've got a situation where, where her issue is, is that if it's like probably task related. Now the problem with that is what's task related? When do I decide it's task related? What if I say this sucks? Is that task related? My God, I'm talking about this task. And it sucks, okay? So you've got to be careful when you're doing that in terms of what do we mean, all right? Anybody want to throw another one out? Yeah. Well, Which one did you do? Talk outs? During instructional time, student will comment or make inappropriate verbal remarks like seven to 10 times a class period. Okay. All right, the number you might want to have just to know what's going on, but it's not actually part of the operational definition, okay? What's inappropriate? <laughs> what do we mean by inappropriate? I remember one time we, I, I would get faculty, or I, I worked at a residential treatment center and I was the director at one point and we'd, staff would be like in the treatment plans that would you know, will be appropriate. I remember one time we were, we were having a board that I said, all right, the board's coming for lunch tomorrow. Would you guys please, we're going to have a luncheon with the staff and the board. Please, please dress appropriately. Right? <laughs> The next day they came, all the staff were dressed up pretty nicely. We were having a picnic. And I said, guys, I said to dress appropriately. All right? Appropriate depends on what the heck you're doing, right? So you've got to be, you've got to be careful with that. This is a way to bring that term home. But you know, what, what do we mean by inappropriate? So what do we mean by inappropriate? How would you change that? Right? That's one of those where you may have to give examples. All right? and, you, and, and don't be afraid to be really clear. So like, things like swearing, too, is a big one. So we'll swear. Well, what's a swear word? My daughter and I constantly argue whether or not sucks is a swear word. Right? I say we don't, Aaron, don't say sucks. That's not a swear word. It is in my house, kind of a thing. You know that old, you're under my roof, by God, sucks is old. You know, um, you know, kind of a thing. But to her, it's not a swear word. All right? So what's a swear word? Okay. So words like inappropriate, be careful of. Others, anybody else want to throw theirs out? We have talking without being called on during structured situations. Do that again? Talking without being called on during structured situations. Talking without being called on during structured situations. So again, we'd get in the situation with your, if it was available to be talking, that would be if they have an exception to that, right? If it was a group kind of work. All right, what's a structured well, that's situation? Like, in like lecture or teacher. Okay. How would I know that's what you meant? Uh, yeah. So if I put teacher. Then. Okay.